Excellent. So you decided not to build your own user permission or authorization system. So let's dig into how Serverless actually works and integrates with your application. Yes, hello, Alex Olivier here from Serbos, and today we're going to go through a bit of an overview of how Serbos is architected and how it plugs into your different applications and services so you can go and get going and building your application without having to think about authorization. So to start off, everything I'm going to be going through today is available on our website, serbos.dev, on the How It Works webpage, um, and you get a very kind of interactive walkthrough of exactly what each stage does. But we're going to drill into this diagram and actually go through it step by step. So this is kind of modeling a typical software application. On your left, you have your users. Uh, their requests are coming into your application um, from a browser, from a mobile client, from any sort of source. And the application block is representative of your code and your app and your business logic. Now, that might be a monolithic block. It might be a service in a web of microservices. It might be uh, something more exotic. Uh, but ultimately, there's an application server that your incoming requests are coming from, uh, from your users. Inside the application block, you sort of know two things based on the request. One is you know who the user is. As they've identified themselves by logging in, they have some sort of credential, and there's probably like a session cookie or a JWT token, something like that, to establish who they are and, and what they do. And with that information, you can then go and actually look up um, from your authentication provider, be it all zero or Okta or something like that, um, some more profile information about them, and also from your own application or an external directory source, information about what like roles and groups and teams and memberships they might uh, be in, and all that kind of context about your users. The second thing you'll generally know about uh, the request is the resource they're trying to access. So you might have a known set of URLs and uh, you got like a request handler or there's some attribute about the incoming request that tells you what this user is trying to access. And you can go and fetch from your data sources, be it your own database or some external service or some API, um, the information about the particular resource that that user is trying to access. And that's kind of demonstrated um, by these two sections. So now in your application, you know who the user is, information about them, and you know the data source and the information about the resource they're trying to access. And typically in an application, this is where you'd be having that if else case switch style logic to work out whether a user can do a particular thing. So you'll be looking at, is there an overlap in the roles of the teams and the, the uh, structure that the resource belongs to? And there'll be a big complicated logic block. And that kind of logic is the thing that you'd have to replicate across lots of different parts of your code base if where you have to check permissions. Um, and it kind of grows out of hand slightly as your business uh, logic uh, evolves and this is obviously a multiplied if you have say a web of microservices where you have services of different languages and you have to re-implement the same logic. So the way the service approaches this is you take those bit of information, the user, the resource and what action they're trying to do uh, and you package that up, that information and send it off to the service instance. So we provide a set of SDKs for all the kind of the common languages now um, and in that request you give it the principal, so the user information, and its attributes about it. They came from your, your own app or from maybe some uh, external directory information. The resource, which is ID, what kind of resource is it, and the attributes that come from your data set. And then the list of actions that user is trying to perform. So these could be your typical create, read, update, delete, but it can be completely open-ended where it's more aligned with your business logic. So you might have a flag action or a approve action, depending on kind of what your app does, and those could be completely open-ended. So via that SDK or directly via the API, you make a request out to a service instance. So a service instance, the yellow block in this diagram that says service in it, um, is deployed alongside your application. So service is distributed as a, either as a container or a binary. Um, you can run it on a VM, you can run it in a Kubernetes cluster, you can run it in a Lambda function. Um, because service is completely stateless, you can, you can run it in pretty much any environment without any sort of external dependencies. Uh, we recommend running it as close to your application as possible purely for network latency reasons. Even though the decisions inside a Serverless are super snappy, depending where you're calling out to your Serverless instance is obviously going to have an impact on that. But inside that Serverless instance, it gets that request of the principle, the resource, and the actions. And then based on the policies that are defined, makes a decision around uh, whether that the action or actions should be allowed or not, and returns a very simple response back to your application. So now in your app code, you're going to get back in either an allow or a deny um, response for a particular uh, request. And then you can, in your app, just have a very simple if else block. If allowed, do whatever action the user has tried to do. And if 
uh, denied, then return a uh, error or a message to the user saying they're not they're not allowed to do that particular action. So your code, which was a big if else case switch style statement, is now a very simple check: is this action allowed or not? Uh, and wherever in your code base you are making authorization checks, be it in a monolithic app or a web and microservices in different languages, is that same interface. You give it the principle, the resource, the actions. You get back and allow or deny. So going back out to the service instance, where do those policies come from? So service policies are what define who's allowed to do what. Um, in a future video, we'll go through authoring those. But your policies can be held in a few different places. Um, po policy repositories uh, vary, and there's uh, three main ones that are supported right now. Uh, the one we kind of recommend, and the one that's being used a lot, is a Git repo. So we're big fans of the GitOps workflow, and you can store your policy files in a Git repository, um, say a GitHub repo, and you configure your service instance to pull the policies uh, from there. But equally, you can store them in some sort of disk storage, be it a cloud storage bucket like S3 or GCS, um, or, or, any, or even just like on disk if you want to mount a folder or build it into an image. Um, and we also support a database backend. So if you want a more dynamic uh, access to your policies and allowing your application to up and, uh, update and modify policies, then you use a database backend with support for Postgres, MySQL, uh, SQL Server, um, just to name a few. Um, and that's where Serverless gets its policies from. Now, the main, my, one of the main advantages of having something like Serverless in place is that because your business logic is now defined in policies that sit in one of those stores, it's completely abstracted out from your application. So the big advantage here now is when your business logic will change, because it's not a question of if it's a question of when from um, our own experience of building applications, that you uh, will be changing policies. And because your business logic is now defined externally to your application, those policies can evolve and change over time without you having to go and edit your code base and uh, raise, a, raise a ticket, get a developer to look at it, rewrite the business logic across every part of the application that's making policy uh, authorization decisions across maybe a web of microservices, different languages. Um, all that doesn't happen anymore because you've implemented that simple check and your policies can evolve. You can push a new policy into your Git repo or push it to uh, an S3 bucket or even update the database and the service instance will automatically get those updates and start serving new uh, authorization results based on those policy changes. So you completely decoupled your business logic from your application code. The second main advantage of having your service and authorization checks standalone from your application is regardless of where your requests are coming from, it could be from a Node API, it could be from a front end React app, it could be from some async worker processing queue uh, in the back end somewhere. Because all the checks go through a service instance, you're going to get a clean, consistent audit log of at this time, this user tried to do this action on this resource, and the result wasn't allow or deny. And for debugging purposes, this is great, but also if you're in a particularly uh, a regulated environment or you only have any certifications like ISO 27001 or SOC 2 certifications, being able to have a clean, consistent, standardized audit log, regardless of where your authorization checks are being made in your app, is a godsend. Uh, from my own personal experience, every year I used to get dragged into a conference room by an auditor and had to demonstrate our access logs to prove that we knew who was trying to access a particular system. This uh, would have been a game changer rather than trying to dig through log files um, that were all sorts of different formats based on the different technology that are running in our stack. The final piece of puzzle I want to just call out here is the query plan block that's um, underneath our uh, action results. So a secondary API that Serverless has, um, as well as like checking whether you have access or not, is to produce a query plan. So one of the harder parts of having a decoupled authorization approach is your logic for filtering your data access from, say, a database when you want to do a listing view or like an index page of all the different resources inside your system is you can no longer just hard code a where clause, for example, on your database to uh, filter out who can do what because your business logic is now actually not in your app code anymore. So the way service approaches this is the secondary API called the query plan where you can give Serverless a user, so the principal information, their ID, their roles, any attributes about them, and a resource kind that they're trying to access. So for example, if this was an expenses system, you would have like an expense resource. And what Serverless will give you back is the smallest set of conditions that you need to apply to your data fetching logic to return just the resources that that user would have access to. So in this, in this lookup, Serverless is doing a check through all the different policies that are defined um, 
and reducing the conditions down to as simple a set possible and doing lots of smart deduping and shortcutting around whether you would always have access or always denied and shortcutting there. But in the case where it's a conditional response, servers will give you back an AST, an abstract, abstract syntax tree, fun word to say, um, which defines the smallest possible set of conditions that you need to be satisfied for a user to have access to a particular resource. So in your application code, you can now take that AST uh, and convert it into a conditional check from your data fetching layer. Now, the reason why Serverless returns an AST is that yeah, conscious that not everyone stores all your data, for example, in a database. You might have some things in Postgres, you might have some things in Redis, you might have some things in Mondo, Mongo, depending on your application requirements. So this AST is a standardized format, which can then be converted and mapped into filters or where clauses or conditions that can be pushed down to your various data fetching layers to return just the resources and that that user would have access to. Now, to make things a bit easier, uh, up in our GitHub, we are releasing a number of adapters for um, automatically converting uh, into common conditional formats. So for example, we have a Prisma adapter if you're in the Node ecosystem and a SQL Alchemy, you know, SQL Alchemy adapter if you're in the Python ecosystem. And those handle the automatic conversion from a Servos um, query plan to a, a conditional filter for that particular uh, data lookup uh, library. So that was a quick run through of exactly how uh, Servos works. Um, as I said, you can find this diagram along with much more detailed um, uh, information about each step on servos.dev. Um, if you just head over to servos.dev and click the how it works link at the top, you are taken to the same diagram. There's more videos explaining these steps and you can also just hover over each step and it gives you a bit more information and links off to resources and assets. So I hope you found this useful on your journey to go and implement authorization inside of your application and hopefully not reinvent the wheel. Uh, as always, you can find everything we talk about today on server.dev. Please come and join our Slack community and also uh, check out the rest of our videos up on our YouTube channel as we go through more detail of how servers works and how you'd integrate it into your application. Thanks.